Hi there, Simon from simonwood.com. I have a German Riesling in front of me, a light Dragonstone Riesling from the Rheingau 2015 vintage. Um, now I'm expecting this to be an off-dry wine. How do I know that? Um, well, I think it's time to pull up a chair. Quick lesson, maybe not so quick, in German wine labels. German wine well, labels, are, I mean, they're very logical. They're often not very simple, however, or helpful. Look at this one from uh, from Donald, for example. So it's made by Donhoff, uh, addressed lower down the label. Uh, it comes from the village of Niederhaus. Uh, it's made from the Hermannshohle vineyard, and it's made from Riesling. The grapes achieved a predicate level known as Auslaser. There's a scale that runs in ascending order of sweetness. Uh, Cabinet, Spätlaser, Auslaser, Beeren Auslaser, and Trocken Beeren Auslaser. Uh, also, you can see from this one, it's from the Nahe region. So if I had Riesling planted out the back of my house in Saddleworth and the weather was much warmer than it's been in this miserable summer, the wine might be called something like Saddleworther Simon's Lawn Riesling Spätlaser 2017. So lots of info, info, but nothing there to say whether Simon's Lawn is actually a good vineyard. Under German law, it might even be not just one vineyard, but a group of vineyards known as a Grosslager. Which is where an organisation called the VDP comes in. Now do you remember when the Super Tuscan movement kicked off in Italy and producers decided to, uh, to uh, rebel against the laws of Chianti Classico and make the best wines they could? Started using either wines that were 100% Sangiovese or maybe putting a little bit of Cabernet, Merlot and a few other things into, uh, into their wines. Well, uh, the Germans are not like the Italians. When they want to kick against the laws, uh, they form a new organisation and come up with a new set of rules. Um, so anyway, but, but the VDP producers who are members of the VDP, they agree to a number of things, but the important ones are this. Only good vineyards feature on the label. So the VDP classification puts the vineyards into a, into a burgundy style hierarchy. Top of the tree are uh, Grosse Lagen, great sites. They're like burgundy Grand Cru. Then come uh, Esterlagen, equivalent of Premier Cru. And wines can be made from other vineyards uh, under the VDP laws, but they, you can never put the name of those vineyards on the, on the label. It might have the name of the village where the vineyard is, or the producer might come up with a, a, a name uh, just to yeah, create it just specifically for that wine. Uh, second thing is, if the wine has a Pradicat level on the label, it's going to be sweet. Um, all other wines are dry, and we'll usually have the word trocken on there somewhere. If the, if the wine's from a Grosse Lager, it will have GG on both the label and the bottle, standing for Grosses Gewex, or Great Growth. And this makes for much simpler labels. Yes, there'll probably be a back label on that's got all the uh, clutter on that satisfy the bureaucrats, but what the customer sees is much more user-friendly. So let's get back to this wine. Why do I expect it to be off dry? It's not from a Grosse Lager or an Erste Lager. Remember, if, it, if it's got names of just those vineyards on the, on the label, it's going to be a dry wine. Uh, nor does it have a Pradicat designation, in which case I'd know it was a sweet wine. Some Riesling labels are a bit helpful here, and uh, they have a scale on the back, which has been produced by something called the International Riesling Federation, uh, which will tell you how far along that dry to sweet scale they, they come, but doesn't appear on, uh, on, on, on this back label. So my guess uh, comes from the alcohol level. In a dry wine, uh, the sugar in the grapes would all have been fermented into alcohol, so you'd have a higher alcohol of label. So if you look at this Lozen label, I featured in a video last week, that's got 12.5% alcohol. Uh, then have a look back at that Dernhoff label that, that was earlier in this, in, in this video. If you can zoom in and just about crane your neck, you might see 7.5% alcohol. Magnificent wine, beautifully balanced, but definitely sweet. So here we're sitting between those two extremes. And if you have a look, it's, um, well, it's a close-up, 10% uh, alcohol. So I'm expecting something that's got a touch of sweetness, but um, um, yes, it's not going to be a sweet wine to, to bring out with, you, with your pudding. If you want to be technical, I think uh, the, the residual sugar level here is about um, 35 grams per litre of, of sugar. Give it a whirl and a sniff. 
So it's got those classic sweet and sour Riesling characters. Um, a little bit of the citrus bite, uh, and then a little bit of that juicier, richer, honeyed, peachy, um, softness, sweetness. Um, I'm salivating here. I'm really looking forward to, to, uh, um, to trying it. Um, and uh, there's something stony and bracing about it. It definitely feels like it's a product of the, of the soil. It says on the back, um, the reason it's called Dragonstone, a fossilised dinos footprint, uh, dinos, dinosaurs footprint uh, was said to have given the name to this south-facing uh, Drachenstein vineyard overlooking the Rhine. Quartzite rock, blah, blah, crisp min minerality, poison, <laughs> elegance. Well, certainly I get a little bit of that rocky aroma. It feels like there is, uh, yeah, this has been s pulled up out of the ground rather than processed in a factory. Well, there's a lovely balance there between those two elements, this crisper element and this richer, rounder element. Sometimes they're having a little snap at each other. Sometimes they're making uh, uh, beautiful music and getting, uh, they're getting almost like getting wrapped around each other the longer the, uh, the, the evening goes on. Uh, so there is this uh, honeyed character uh, and honeyed peach, a little bit of um, uh, something uh, like guava in there, an ever so slightly tropical edge. But then there are these tenser, tauter, mineral and citrus things to, uh, to, to bite against them. But then the softness, the, the juiciness uh, comes back and, and, and reasserts itself all the way through these two elements sitting very nicely together and having a... Um, one of the, it's almost like one of those couples that know each other so well and there's a little bit of bickering, but there is this intense, uh, intense relationship. They're, they're always going to be different, but they're always going to get on really, really nicely. Um, they, su they suggest on the back of here uh, spicy cuisine, seafood and salads. Uh, and I can, I suppose it depends on what the, what the salad is, but I can certainly see it with the, that touch of spice will be rounded out by uh, uh, the, the, the sweetness in the wine. Uh, meanwhile, if you've got the, the seafood element, uh, you've got that, uh, that taut character that's just biting through it and going, uh, it's almost like squeezing a lemon on, the, uh, uh, on food. And uh, so maybe why, why not combine the two, Something, an ever so slightly uh, aromatic rather than out and out spicy uh, Asian dish. I'd love to uh, uh, drink rather a lot of that. And only 10% alcohol. Uh, and maybe wouldn't have too much of a uh, sore head if I got to my third, possibly even a fourth glass. But hey, see you soon.